honor and pleasure to welcome you to the closing event of Dortmunder Positionen 2, a conference organized by architect and Rome Prize fellow Heike Hanada. And um, it's my great pleasure to welcome our guest of honor tonight, the artist and great inspirator, not only for architects but, and visual artists, but I think for the cultural scene in general, Rachel Whiteherid. Rachel will introduce you into her work in conversation with Lorcan O'Neill, her long-term gallerist based here in Rome. And it's, um, we are very much looking forward to listening and watching what you have to tell us. Thank you very much, Lorcan, for guiding us through the, this evening. Which colour we have? <laughs> Hi. Um, so uh, I am a, a sculptor. Um, I originally trained as a painter, um, and I've now been working um, seriously as an artist since 1987. And you know, so that's a lot of work to um, to cover. So I decided, because of the nature of, of the symposium. Uh, that I would just concentrate on sort of architectural works that I've uh, done over the past um, number of years. <laughs> well, 32, 32, 32 years. years. <laughs> um, so. Here's a clicker. So, can we take the lights down a little bit or not? Oh, sorry. Can, can we take the lights down a bit or not? It's too, it's too bright. Um, so... This is you working on Ghost. Yes. <clears throat> so, in, in 1989. Um, so, Ghost was really the first... The first sculpture I ever made was something called Closet, which was the cast of, a, of the inside of a, a wardrobe which I then um, stood up and covered in black felt, and I was trying to sort of convey the notion of sitting in a, a dark space. Sort of from that really came, it, it was the sort of crux of all of the work that I do now. Um, it was about making space solid, it was about reversing things, it was about playing sort of psychological games with an object, um, and then consequently the viewer. Um, but, you know, as a very young artist, uh, I had no money at all. And in order to make something like Ghost, um, I had to sort of raise money and sort of... Ha ha before I even started making the work, I had to be extremely clear about what it was I was going to do. Um, so what I tried to do, find was a, a, a room which had um, a door and a fireplace and cornicing and skirting board. They were, they were the sort of elements that I wanted in the room. And that was the sort of typical um, space that one might live in. So when, you know, when I was a <clears throat> child, I grew up in, in rooms like this. When I left home, I went to college and I rented a place like this. You know, so it was somewhere that was really much about, about my experience and trying to be uh, sort of every man's experience. But, you know, when I was um, thinking about making it, I knew that I had to raise some money. And in order to do that, I had to think in quite a sort of a creative way, but also trying to think of, of sort of a, almost like a poetic language to try and explain what it was I was going to make it, but in quite an abstract form. Um, so with Ghost, for example, I said that I wanted to mummify the air in a room. And that was... You know, I think the first time that I managed to sort of express, uh, you know, and then calling it ghosts. So, you know, words were always, excuse me, <clears throat> words were always very important in trying to uh, 
kind of make something happen before it actually appeared. It was my way of somehow turning this this sort of imaginary thing into a sort of form, you know, a lyrical form before it became a, a concrete form. But um, so to be more specific, where did you find this room? So the room, um, so I worked in um, some studios which there were, were two during the sort of 80s and 70s, 80s. There were two um, sort of cooperatives, artist cooperatives that set up uh, uh, sort of large scale um, buildings for studios for artists and then would rent them cheaply. And I kind of borrowed this room from Acme Studios and I got some money from something called Elephant, the Elephant Trust, which was money that um, <clears throat> a surrealist and great friend of Picasso's, Roland Penrose, uh, had put some money in a, in a fund and I applied for that and got some money from that. So there was all sorts of ways of kind of pulling it together. But, you know, I had a bicycle. This building where I was making the work was a sort of 45 minute cycle uphill to get to. And, you know, I would order plaster, but I couldn't order it all in once because I couldn't afford it all, so. But, but so you made it in pieces? So I made it in pieces. So if you look at, at, at the way this is um, here, I thought I looked at the room and um, worked out, sorry, it should be about here. But, um, I looked at the room and worked out that it needed to have a foundation or at least a, the room needed to be flat because it was sort of going at all sorts of funny angles. So I made this sort of foundation to start with. And then I thought about Piero della Francesca's paintings and thinking about composition and knowing that I couldn't make this thing on my own and have enormous pieces of plaster. So I kind of based it on my body size and also the sort of composition of, you know, an Italian master of perspective and, um, and poetry. So I, uh, that's, that was where I started from, and I worked inside it mainly on my own, um, partly with my husband, Marcus, who's sitting here. Um, we met at art school. <laughs> <laughs> and it took me about probably about three months to make it, and then I took it to my studio. Uh, and it's made of plaster. It's made of plaster and hessian, very, very simple, old-fashioned you know, sculptural materials. And then I bought a lot of um, uh, stuff called Dexian, which is like a, uh, a system, like, like Meccano, um, which I used. It was all secondhand and kind of rusty, and then took that to the studio and worked for a, a long time trying to work out how to make the two things sort of fit together. Um, and it wasn't, I suppose, until about five months into the project that I went into the studio one morning and looked at the door. So if we can go on to the next next slide, yeah. Uh, sorry, the door's around the other side, but looked at the door and and the light switch and realized that what I'd done was I'd, I'd sort of made myself the wall and looking at the work, I was the wall. And that was a, a kind of eureka moment. So between that and making Closet, which was, I would say, the first, first sculpture I ever made, you know, that, that is the sort of genesis of, of what I still do, you know, 30 odd years later. But you, so you just said a little earlier that it was solidifying the air. In the yes, room. I wanted to mummify the air. Mummify. That, was, that was, so, you know, it's sort of using words, using materials, using my passion for making something that, that sort of brought this, this project together. So that was in 1990. And so presumably quite soon afterwards, you began to work yes. or look for a bigger... Project. Yeah, so, so, you know, these, these bigger projects, the ones that I'm talking about here, they all take a lot longer to make than any of the kind of studio work that I make. And with, with the studio work, it's much more uh, me working on my own or with an assistant and, you know, uh, being able to sort of concentrate and, and make things in a very direct way. There was a, or there is, a, a group called Art Angel in London. J j just before saying that, just, this is called House. This is called House, yeah. And, <clears throat> um, and it's a building, or was a building, on a street in London. It was a, a Victorian house on a street by Victoria Park 
in the East End, the heart of the sort of East End of London. And I'd spent a long time sort of thinking about doing this, but I had this, the opportunity given to me by a group called Art Angel who asked if there was anything I wanted to make at all in the world. And I said, yes, I wanted to cast a house, and they said yes. So we worked on this project for about two years, I think, before um, it was finished. And, um, you know, it was an extraordinary project in many ways. Um, but I suppose in the end, the, the thing that really stuck with this project is the sort of furore and the sort of political um, machinations it had and the way in which it affected people's lives, uh, the way it made people think about public sculpture, uh, the way public sculpture was then taken into parliament. And, you know, it was an enormous thing, be, be, which... Be, because there was a, a lot of the discussion... Uh, originally, the House was a temporary sculpture. That was the idea. And people fell in love with it. And then when the moment came to remove it, it created a public discussion. Well, there was a sort of public outcry as soon as it happened, as soon as it was on the street and as soon as people could see it. Because people either fell in love with it, and I'm not talking about people, educated people just that were you know, very clear about w what it was and what it was trying to do. It was everybody, it was, a, it was a work for everybody. And that was what was so interesting about it. So builders would comment and taxi drivers would comment. Taxi drivers would pick up people from the airport and, you know, and they'd say, I want to go and see that house. And they'd go, oh, I know where that is. And they'll drive them straight. That, you know, there, there was something about it that just touched everybody. And you know, I think that's basically about people's uh, desire for home and desire for a, a kind of way of um, being and, and living and understanding what these rooms were. And, but that for some people, it, it, it made them very angry because it was a place that they couldn't enter and that they felt blocked out from, whereas other people thought it was something that was a very... Uh, celebratory experience. But just to give a little background, it was a street of row houses in the east end, eastern side of London. So they were originally quite modest Victorian houses, many of which had been destroyed during the war. Or yeah, a lot had been destroyed during the war. Just up the road, there was um, there was a, a plaque on the wall where um, you know lots of bombs had, had happened around there was a lot of council housing a lot of that area had been destroyed but what was also interesting about the area was that it was it was when sort of thatcher's britain was in its um glorious state and um she was had been trying to make this kind of green corridor running from the east end out to canary wharf which was the new supposedly this sort of new utopia which has never really worked quite frankly but it was um so it was all about that as well so i what i was i really once we found this place i knew that it was exactly the right place because there were so many messages that could be sort of read into it and um things that were already there that could be utilized this is just a a, a silly question, but did you ever find out much about the family who actually had been living in that house? Indeed, before? yeah, I'm still in touch with one of the daughters, actually. She, she the, the father, who was called Mr. Gale, and the whole family had lived in the house for many, many years, and he was a DIY fanatic, so it was a fantastic kind of interior of, of homemade bars and... Um, furnishings and strange ways in which you deal with a door and everything. Every room had different wallpaper in it and lino and it was a real sort of um, festivity of um, bad taste really. <laughs> but, but he, um, but he, you know, he was a, a, a great guy and when I first met him he, he loved the project, loved the idea that he, his house was going to be memorialised. But the other interesting thing about it was that he had been this lone kind of character amongst this whole row of houses that had been there. He refused to be moved, completely refused for his family to be moved into a high rise, which is what happened to everybody else. So he really stuck to his guns and got rehoused into another very nice Victorian house around the corner. Um, but then the people started saying, you know, surely you can't like this. 
surely, uh, and you know, um, people from the newspapers like the Sun newspaper, which is a really kind of trashy newspaper, would say, you can't like this, you know, it's, and, and they started feeding him lines, and then he would say, with his flat cap on, you know, and there'd be a picture of him saying, you know, if this is art, I'm Leonardo da Vinci, and things like that. So he was sort of being pulled into this thing, and his children were, were devastated because they loved it, and, you know, they loved what had happened to their home. Um, One of the things you can't see in these photographs is the amount of detail in the house. I remember, you know, the details of the kitchen or the locks on the doors or the door handles, hinges, even the texture maybe of the wallpaper. There, there's an enormous amount of detail in these in the surface there that is very hard to pick up in these big photographs. Yeah, and there was also a patina, um, as you can see, areas of yellow, and there were sort of blues and yellows and pinks and soot on the fireplaces and, you know, all of these things that, that sort of had... It was a sort of fossilised family home in a way. Um, so, so tell us what happened eventually. Well, there was, there was a particular sculpture. man in the, in the local... Um, government who, who hated it and he as soon as he saw it he wanted it was his mission to get it torn down and um, so there was all this stuff in parliament about it and blah 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 anyway after we managed to keep it up for an extra three months by renting the land off the local council and um, and then it was torn down and, you know, I, people always say... So, so it was visible for how long in total? It was visible for about five months, all in all. Mm -hmm. And, you know, by the time it was... I, I didn't show... Because there's so much stuff to talk about, I didn't show all these pictures of, you know, later on in its life, there was graffiti all over it and, you know, all sorts of things. It had a, it had a very hard life being there as a sort of public sculpture. Um, so you were... About 30. I was made. about, I was 29, I think, when I made it. And, you know, interestingly, people like, I'm sure you've all heard of Charles Saatchi, but uh, <clears throat> Charles Saatchi, who was sort of the art collector at the time, wanted to buy it and he wanted to put it on wheels and take it over to his, you know, his fabulous gallery and plonk it down there. And I just said, no, I don't, you know, it has a life and its life is here and then it will be demolished. And I was devastated when it was demolished, um, partly because I felt that I'd never seen it because it was just always, there was always so much controversy around it. Um, so um, that was 1990. Can you just go to the last, the yeah. next slide? Yeah. Um, so, so if I just, you know, that was what it was like originally. That was it cast, and then that's what it looks like now. And it still looks like that. It's just a... It's become a park. It's a park. It was always a, a park behind it. And, um, you know, it's a park that no one really goes into. No one uses it. And, you know, that's that. It's, it just is a, is a memory. So that was a public sculpture in the East End of London. And then 22 years later, you made... Oh, sorry. No. <laughs> we, we moved on to... Was, oh, yeah. Um, what, j just b before going on to the Holocaust Memorial, this is a sculpture also in the East End, East End of London. Yes, yeah. um, do you want to say something about that, <clears throat> just while we're in, yeah, this, still this, in the East End yes, of London? Yes, still in the East End. Um, so this is um, the Whitechapel Art Gallery um, in London, which was a very, very, um, a very interesting gallery in terms of where it, where it is but also where it, where it was when it first opened, and it was next to a library. Um, and in the sort of 90s, um, they got permission to buy the library next door and extend the gallery. And they worked with some very good architects, and I was asked if I would um, somehow try and make an artwork on the outside to sort of celebrate and sort of bring the two things together. It was... So just to interrupt for one second, so the Whitechapel and the library next door were um, Victorian good work type of institutions in the East End for poorish people, or which was always an immigrant area. Yeah, well. and there was a very big Jewish population there, and it was the place, it, you know, it was a real sort of study centre for the sort of Jewish, local Jewish community. 
and then the Bangladeshi community and, you know, sort of various other people that, that kind of moved into well, the, the area. The, the Huguenots originally uh, The Huguenots, that's right, yeah. the Huguenots from France as well. Um, <coughs> but... And so, and so you did these um, uh, leaves yeah, so in bronze on the surface. I mean, the, the, the problem with doing something like this, as I'm sure any architect knows, is that when you work with a building that has a sort of historical context, um, you have an enormous amount of red tape to get through and to deal with, you know, the conservation of the building, the conservation of the neighbourhood, and everybody has something to say about everything. Um, so it becomes a very hard task to, to, to do any, you know, basically to do anything to the frontage of somewhere like this. But my brief was to do something to the front. So I decided to use um, th these two areas at the side on the pillars that were um, the tree of life on the building. And they, I, I sort of made casts of the, the leaves and cast the leaves in bronze and then covered them in gold leaf. And they, what, what, what I, part of my research for this, and I tend to, when I do something like this, I do a lot of research just around the area, just looking, taking photographs, thinking, and, you know, that would normally takes me around six months, I'd say. And I'd gone up to um, St. Paul's Cathedral, which is, you know, not far away, and, and looked at, uh, around and just thought, what is it that makes all of these different buildings, you know, hundreds of buildings from, you know, various centuries, what is it that kind of joins it all together? And it was the gold leaf, and it was the gold leaf that kind of you know, sometimes you hardly see at all, other lights it, it, it sings, you know, it's a, it's a kind of interesting sort of invisible, visible material. So I decided to use this to, to somehow highlight the, the, the front of... Um, but what you also did was bring a little bit of nature to the front of that building in a part of London which really doesn't have many parks or gardens and things like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the interesting thing about the East End is so every bit of brickwork that hasn't been looked after for a number of years has plants growing out of it. And um, so that was also something that I thought about was just the, the way these things just appear and grow. You know, shrubs that can be enormous shrubs attached to a building through a tiny little bit of brickwork, you know. So it was about trying to sort of bring all those sort of... Uh, the sort of neglect, but the positivity and all of those things together. Uh, the other thing that I did was there were originally windows in the front here, and I used my um, uh, my sort of turning things back to front and inside out by using so that as a motif. those four windows in that area up there are added by you? They're, are they're, they're added by me, and they're, they're cast, and they're actually bricks. Um, they're, I think they're in, in sort of like eight pieces. They're kind so of they're, they're sort bricks. of cast reverse of the windows yes, underneath. Yes, underneath yeah. it, yeah, yeah, exactly. But I wanted, I wanted this to go all the way over the other part of the building and to, get, to attach itself to the other um, piece of sort of foliage up there, but I wasn't allowed to touch this building. And it was kind of nonsense because there's a virtually identical building five minutes around the corner across the road from Liverpool Street Station where lots of things have been attached to it over the years. So, you know, there's something interesting with the people that make these sort of decisions, these historical societies that make these decisions that, you know, they say are sort of, you know, it has to be like this, but actually they change their minds all the time. But, you know, it might be someone that had worked 15 years before had said something and, you know, so... So, so on that note, before going to Vienna, um, just to stay in London one last moment, this is a piece that you made in the very centre, centre of London, from actually where a lot of the measurements out of London are taken from, Trafalgar Square. Yeah. It's, it's um, just here. Yeah, the measurements, the measurements and um, house numbers and all of those things sort of come really from this area, don't they? Yeah. And <clears throat> so, sort of so, tra so Trafalgar Square has the monument to the big column with the... It's in front of the National Gallery and the National Portrait Nelson's, Gallery. Nelson's column, National Gallery is there. Um, so, th and the traffic all runs around and there's four huge plinths or bases, three of which have statues to Great Britain's kings yeah. or something. And one has always been empty. And it became known as the sort of empty plinth 
project. Um, I was one of the first people to, to do it. And um, actually, since, since this has happened, um, the, it's become a pedestrianized, uh, it, you know, it's not a, a big roundabout anymore. But when I proposed this, there were, it was just extraordinary. There were red buses and taxis and, you know, the, the Trafalgar Square was always just full of people and pigeons and, you know, it was just chaos. And since it has been pedestrianized, it's really kind of calmed it down, actually. And um, so it feels like a very different place. So th was this, this was the first, so up until this, this piece was made in 1999, 2001. Um, and you've used resin here rather than the concrete you used for house or the plaster you used for ghost. Yeah, I mean, I made a lot of decisions that, that, you know, they were made in a much quieter way in the studio working on smaller sculptures. But, you know, I'd made a lot of work in plaster. Um, I'd been kind of fed up with plaster. I, I got fed up with the, how fragile it was and I started to work with uh, rubber and um, the rubber because that, that felt much more robust. And then from that, I got kind of fed up with being, you know, looking at something and being sort of pushed away from it. So I was looking for something that was transparent you, you that you could be pulled into, you know, so looking into something which had sort of internal edges and the, internal the spaces, the light came through, etc. So this, um, I'd, I'd actually made, I'd, it's not in, in this lot of slides, but I'd also made something in New York which was the cast of a water tower in resin. And I'd done a lot of research when I'd made that. Um, and, you know, this is, was the largest resin casting ever made. And so so it it's not obvious from this photograph, but um, it's, very, it's really enormous, it's enormous this sculpture. Yeah. The, the plinth there, I mean, a human being stands to just the top level of stones there. So, so the, the, the thing is huge and nobody had ever made anything using resin that size before no no and you know you know i know why <laughs> because it's very difficult it's very expensive lots of mistakes happen um it doesn't do what you want it to do um and we had it out um in the weather and actually um realized that it couldn't i mean it was fine when it was there but when when it came down realized i needed to sort of reshape it slightly and it, it actually can't withstand the kind of temperature change and things like that that of we thought it could. being outdoors like that. Yeah, yeah, being outdoors like that. So. But it was a, it was another work of yours, a public work in London within ten years of house that um, captured the imagination of people. Yeah, and what what I was trying to do there was to make a pause, make something much quieter, and I didn't, you know, almost something invisible because I was, I was actually very fed up with the kind of attention that, w w you know, it wasn't just me, but there, there were other artists um, that really, you know, tried to get attention, and I wasn't trying to get attention, I was just trying to make my work, but, you know, there were lots of other artists that were much louder in their approach to making art and their careers and things, and I just wanted to get on with it quietly. Um, so, speaking of that and being quiet, we're now going to go back to the slide of the Holocaust Memorial in Vienna. And I knew you at that time, and I know that this was a project that took many years to bring to fruition. There was an enormous amount of discussion of it, about it, from the early in, you know, ideas behind it right through to completion. And I'm sure we're not going to be able to touch on much of that today, but just so that everyone knows, it, was a, it took a huge amount of Rachel's time, years to make, but also negotiations and uh, keeping everyone calm. Yeah. <laughs> there, there were three changes of government in the time that so I made this. So just, this is in Vienna? This is in Vienna. It's in a square called Judenplatz, which is the J Jewish uh, place. And the, uh, I worked with some very good architects out there. And we, um, well, I made the proposal uh, to do this, and they made a proposal to to, to work underside the, the piece. Underneath it, there's a um, uh, th what was originally the synagogue. So there's small bits of kind of stone and air areas of that w were the original synagogue. Um, and then behind, in the um, 
uh, right-hand corner there is this sort of Jewish study center. When I made this, um, I'd lived in Berlin for uh, it, just a year, 18 months actually, and during that time of living in Berlin, I'd done a lot of research um, into the sort of heaviness of what had happened. And, and if I hadn't have done that, I would never have approached a subject like this because obviously it's, it's not something to be touched on lightly. Um, and so, I, so essentially, this, when somebody comes up to it, it, it looks like casts of books. Yeah, it's the casts of the insides of books. So it's the pages of books. So all of the spines are sort of turned inside out. So it's as if, you know, you can't be on the interior of the room. Um, so it's a library. It's a library. And it's based on the scale of the rooms uh, in the surrounding buildings. Um, the, the where did the idea of a library come from? Well, it was to do with the Jewish people being the people of the book. Um, and, but, it, you know, the, the, the other part of this, sorry, is that on the roof there's a, a big ceiling rose and that acts as the sort of drain um, for water or snow or whatever happens in, you know, it's, Vienna is a very um, elemental kind of city. Um, and that acts as a drain, so it's sort of almost like the, the kind of tears sort of run through the centre of it which no one really knows about, apart from the people that live in the surrounding building. Um, and then around the outside of it, in stainless steel, is, is the names of all the concentration camps and the number of people that died. So it, it, it's a very, very heavy, but very quiet um, piece. And, and it's made of concrete. And it's made of concrete, yeah. And it inside it, also, it has... Um, uh, a large amount of these sections of books that were cast and they, they live inside it because I thought that it would be damaged, I thought it would be vandalised because I don't want to offend anyone here if they're Austrian but you know the, the nature of trying to make this project, it, people were so angry and um, there was obviously, there was such a kind of form of denial um, and I know from living in Berlin that that's absolutely the opposite of, of what happened in Germany. And, you know, it's like people say that, you know, uh, Hitler was German and uh, Mozart was Austrian or, you know, that, but in fact it was the kind of other way around. You know, so the, the, the way in which people wanted to remember what happened was very um, manipulated. And... It felt like the entire city, well, the entire country, it felt like there was a big kind of rug on the floor and if you just peeled the edge up, it was just maggots everywhere and it was sort of horrendous. So this opened in the year 2000? This opened in the year 2000, yeah. And, and uh, you'd been working on it for about four about years? Si about five years, six right. years maybe. Mm. Um, and I was so determined to make it happen, you know, even though it was so painful to to work there, I would go there on day trips. It was, you know, I hated it so much that I'd, you know, do these very painfully long days. Um, but eventually it happened, it's there. I'm extremely proud of it. I don't want to kind of moan about it in terms of, um, you know, the, the country was brave enough for it to go there. You know, they paid for it, they have respected it, and, you know, hats off to them because it's something that people are very proud of. It's now in guidebooks. It's become part of their sort of... And it's an history. entirely public sculpture. You just walk into that yeah. square. You just walk there. into that, yeah. It was... It had become a... It had been a car park, and uh, they, they'd cleared all of that. I think, apparently, now the car parking's creeping back in again a bit. But, um, but yeah, I mean, people go there and... So, around know. that time, you and Marcus bought a synagogue in London. We did. Um... <laughs> Which was no longer a synagogue, obviously. Yeah. And you moved to live there and work there and have your studios. Yeah, before, so a number of things happened. Uh, we had children. Um, we bought this dilapidated building. Um, again in the East End. Yeah, and again in the East London. End. And it was one of those kind of strange, we'd been looking for somewhere um, to, to, to do a, a project, you know, to, to, to live and work in. Um, partly because we wanted to be sort of with the kids and, you know, be able to work, you know, sort of somehow juggle it all in, in one place. 
Um, and but in or, so in order to try and sort of uh, make sense of the whole thing, I decided to cast everything in it, really. So I cast three staircases, and I cast these two sort of apartments that the uh, rabbi had lived in. Um, and, you know, they became these pieces which, um, you know, the staircases especially, I think, did something quite extraordinary with, um, you know, how you looked at space and how, a sta you know, these things were made, you know, people kind of look at them and go, how on earth did you make that? But they were actually made sort of on site in a staircase and then, like a Chinese puzzle, the whole thing was sort of collapsed sort of internally and then put up again, you know, in a bigger room and um, you had to sort of work from the inside out. So, you know, there, you know I, I do these things. I don't do them on my own, obviously, but um, I have a, a, this great guy who I've worked with for many, many years who was my assistant as soon as he left college. And then I kind of kicked him out and he now runs his own business and, I, you know, I kind of continue to work with him. But it's Meaning he, he helps you fabricate how it Helps fabricate these things. And is, you know, we... So these are made of... The, these are made of uh, jesmonite, which is like a, a, a sort of plasticized plaster, fiberglass type material. It's as close to plaster as I can get that you can... Things can be light, so you can make very large things. So this is at the Tate Gallery. That's at the Tate, yeah. And is this in Washington, this one? Uh, it looks like yes, I think Washington. that's in Washington, yeah. So they <coughs> are not... It's not one piece. These come yeah, apart they're, yeah. and they're joined up. Yeah, this, this one, in fact, um, because as I've made things over the years, um, you know, they're mainly things that are ca cast from the actual objects and the actual um, situation that they're in. But I did, I, you know, I'd, and I'd always set myself all these very hard and fast rules, but I decided that um, I could break that rule because I'm an artist and I can do what I want. <laughs> but it, um, and so uh, this one is actually an invented staircase. So this was made from a mold. And it was a very interesting step to, to make that decision, to, to, to kind of think, well, you know, well, then it can be anything or it can be like... So now some of the things that I make have elements of um, reality and elements of, of things that I've kind of made up. Um, and these are all um, sculptures for interiors. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So having spent up until then and then afterwards working <clears throat> on large, very public sculptures where you engaged with town councils and public opinion, etc. You began to work on a group of sculptures which are in remote places, um, not likely to at least... Cause offence. Ca <laughs> cause offence. <laughs> Uh, in, in, in large things, and you've called this series of sculptures shy sculptures. And so the first one we're going to look at is in a fjord in Norway. Yeah, it's, it's... And it's from 2010. So this is the first one that I made. And, you know, often these kind of projects come about by a sort of obscure local council somewhere who who said you know who someone just says oh has anyone seen Rachel Whiteread's work and they kind of go oh yeah and they kind of oh, what do you think of it? oh I quite like it you know well let's ask her and you know and often and I'm, and I'm not going to say this too loudly but you know I'll do these things for you know out of love rather than making any kind of money out of it and so you know a project like this um, this very interesting um, town councillor came to me and said, w you know, would you come and make something? And, and actually Marcus uh, went out, so we, we ha you know, I'd sort of spoken to him about it. And we had talked about collaborating on things, which we don't actually do, we realised it wasn't a good idea. But he, he, did, he actually found this, this building um, and um, he'd gone out there and was <clears throat> walking with the mayor, I think, around... around um, around this, this fjord, really. And I said, you know, if possible, I wanted it on water and, you know, got close to water. So we found this boathouse, and um, at that time, 
we thought the only way to do it was to sort of cast it in place, so it was cast over there um, in, pl in position. But was it a boathouse that belonged to somebody? It, it belongs to somebody. It was sort of partly derelict. They didn't really want it. They were happy for it to be bought by the local council. Um, and then we, we went about casting it. And it's, so it's made up of concrete. It's very solid. Um, and it sits on this fjord and it gets, uh, you know, it gets all the elements. It gets frozen into the winter and it gets, you know, flowers grow around it in the summer. It, you know, it has this kind of natural life. And we do nothing to it and no one's ever damaged it and it just sort of sits there very quietly. It's about 25 miles out of Oslo and, you know, anyone can go and see it whenever they like. It's never, never open or closed. Um, and there's a number of other pieces that I've made like this over the years. This is uh, in the desert in California. Um, and there are these little buildings there called shotgun shacks. Um, shotgun shacks. Shotgun shacks, shacks yeah. And they, you know, they were small parcels of land that, that were sort of sold to people that lived uh, in the city that they could use as little holiday homes. Um, and people would, you know take their guns and, you know, shoot things. Go shooting. Go please. shooting, go shooting. Um, so, uh, and a, a guy, that uh, uh, an interesting guy sort of said, look, I've bought this place, will you cast it? And I kind of went, mm, maybe, went out there, had a look, and decided I'd do it. He then bought another place, so we don't have, we don't have the other one. But um, So, you know, this is really, for me, these projects are really about trying to make things happen in places that... Um, are remote, that the journey, the weather, the elements, the time are all part of the experience of going to, to visit this work. And that really uh, stems from, you know, a lot of you know, people like Smiths and, and, you know, about making these, these events and, you know, making a piece that's an event. Um, this is a little less remote, but remote nonetheless, this one. Yes, yeah, so this, this piece here, this is um, on a place called Governor's Island in New York. Um, very soon after 9-11, within a couple of months, um, I was asked if I would think about trying to make a memorial to 9-11. And I thought about it for about two seconds and said, absolutely not. You know, this isn't finished with, it's too, it's too raw. It's not the right time. I just didn't feel it was appropriate. Um, a number of years later, um, a, a guy called Tom Eccles uh, asked me if I would get involved with this place, which is um, called Governor's Island, which had been um, an island just off um, uh, the sort of tip of Manhattan, which had been the... Um, what do you call it? The... Um, Penal place. No, it wasn't a penal colony. It was a, a, a quarantine. Quite, no, it wasn't a quarantine either. It was when you people bring in and you have to pay taxes on stuff. What's that called? Um, that anyway. It was Bo a bonded <laughs> warehouse. <Yes. laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was, and um, so I kind of travelled around the island. But, but just interrupt. The, the interesting thing about this site, when you're on Governor's Island, you look straight over to the Statue of Liberty, I, yeah, and you look. Oh. I'm just coming to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I looked around the island and chose this spot which looks straight over to where the Twin Towers had been and straight over to the Statue of Liberty and for me it was the perfect spot to make my memorial uh, which is this which is this sort of dishevelled house which has the feeling of that a terrorist might have lived there, that a Unabomber had been there. You know, I wanted to have that sort of sinister feel. Um, very quietly, you know, as I did with the Holocaust Memorial where um, I forgot to mention, um, you know, for an artist, y you don't go to what I know you all know about full well, a, a jury's, where you have a jury to discuss whether or not your project will be will happen, and I'd had to go for a jury about the uh, Holocaust Memorial, and they said, oh, we don't like this, it looks like a bunker. And I said, a bunker, really? And of course I wanted it to look like a bunker, but I pretended that 
I didn't want it to look like a bunker at all. I wanted it to look like a pretty library. And, you know, so it's always a little bit about using those things, which I, you know, full well know that's what they are. Um, but uh, you, sometimes you have to, you know, hide those things a bit so you can get them through. This is particularly detailed. What was that originally? Well, again, it was, you know, I, I, I collect old wood, old bits of brick and corrugated iron and building materials, but, and, then, and then use them to sort of make these buildings. So this is a completely fictionalised building. But it was also based on, um, you know, Thoreau's uh, house and, you know, things that were... Walden uh, Yes, yeah, so, sorry, Walden. Um, so about the... You know, about using places which had a kind of romanticism about them, but also had a, a sort of something more eerie about them. Um, and again, this is another, another piece. This is... Um, uh, it's in the north of England. It's in the north of England in, in Yorkshire. And it's in a forest, and it is the cast of a Nissan hut. Which uh, explain what a Nissan hut is or was. Well, Nissan hut, I'm sure everybody knows what they're. They're very kind of international structures that were built, uh, but were developed by this English guy who uh, was trying to work, find, work a way of making quick structures during war. Um, where that could be used for for storage, for for ammunition storage, for hospitals, for so there's you know it's about having these, you know, two different types of material, uh, or three, depending on how they were made. But sometimes brick, but mainly just wood and corrugated iron, and they could be put up on sites in difficult places, you know, quite easily. And they were substantial buildings, and a lot of them still exist. I'm sure they exist all around G Germany. Um, too, but um, yeah. So, uh, so that was uh, another kind of project like that. So. Um, and then I made a number of other pieces. This one is called the Chicken Shed, um, which was a originally a chicken shed. It's an actual was an actual building. This is this is shown um, outside of the Tate in London. Um, when I made an exhibition, a retrospective there, um, yeah. So um, these next slides, if I, you, are, yeah. this is the new American embassy in London, and these are some of the entrance hall areas, right? Yeah, it's the, so there was a, a a very big new embassy built in London. There had been in this very beautiful building, um, which is now being turned into a, into a hotel. Um, and they, the Americans decided that they needed something that was much more substantial, that was more secure, et cetera, et cetera. So they built this new building, very strange building. Um, and at the front of it, uh, is, there has a very different sort of entrance. This is the entrance not that all the dignitaries use, it's where the, every, every man goes through, every woman goes through to get, with, to get their passports and or their, their visas. visas and yeah. Like um, and it was... So these are the walls um, yeah. of this, this entrance way. So, yeah, so these are what, so I was thinking about, you know, America and Europe and the Statue of Liberty and the cabin that I'd made and all these different things. And then I was thinking about immigration and housing and how people brought things with them. And, you know, during this time in America, uh, when, you know, when an enormous amount of people came over there, uh, this kind of flat pack housing had been developed. And um, this is based on that. It's not actually the same size because I couldn't make it fit. Um, so it, it's, it's about two-thirds of the size of an actual house. So these were houses that people would have carried with them when they were going west to California or places like yeah, that? Yeah, or you could, you could buy on, uh, you know, by catalogue. You'd buy them on catalogue and you'd, you know, you'd look at a catalogue and you'd go, OK, we'll have that one, and then it would literally arrive in pieces and someone would kind of put them up. And so was it another type of quick house? Yes, it was, yeah. So... Um, this, you know, the, some of them I think were, were was kind of quite temporary structures, but mainly they became houses. And America is completely full of them now. I mean, they've been, you know, the, 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 
they have a, a, a longevity to them. Um, so I wanted to make this thing which had this dialogue between, you know, um, over, uh, you know, across the Atlantic, as it were. Um, so, but if you see, if we just go through, I mean, there's an enormous amount of detail on them. You know, there's the, the there's wood and there's. Uh, windows and little tiny fixtures and fittings. Um, if you see just down the bottom here, there's sort of light switches and um, door handles and plugs and all of those sorts of things. So, it, you know, I wanted to make something that was like a, a freeze um, with the roof and the... Um, it was like stairs. And the stairs, the yeah. And, on the walls. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Again, there's an enormous amount of detail in these works that you don't ever get from seeing a photograph in a book. You really have to see them in real life because they have, they, they soak up every tiny bit of detail of, the, of what was there once before. Um, your most recent works are probably these. They are, yeah. So, so after having made a lot of solid work over the years and things that were cast in a, in a very particular way, um, we had coronavirus and lockdown. And, um, you know, I think there's one thing the artists know how to do is to be on their own. And, you know, I think what, what was so kind of extraordinary about this time was that so many people didn't know how to be on their own. And, you know, it, was, it, it wasn't that there was a, a sort of smugness for artists, but it, it just felt like everyone else was in the same position. And people had to learn how to create things for themselves and use all this time that they had. And you know, I don't know if it... it I think it's probably the same kind of worldwide, but you know, in the UK, arts and crafts, people, everyone was doing arts and crafts and baking and reading and watching movies. And, you know, it was like a sort of, you know, a two year weekend. Uh, but, but so these were made, so it, we've been looking at 30 years of work that began as probably real life items. These are completely created structures. They're made from scraps. Yeah, so they're complete, so th this, this one is, this piece is called Poltergeist, um, and um, it's made completely from bits of wood which I just collected, and you know, whenever I was making a, a shy sculpture or we were demolishing a building that, you know, um, we were then going to sort of put together back in the studio in order to make the sculpture, you know, a lot of this stuff that, you know, most people would have put in the skip, I was keeping and drying out. And I had no idea what I was going to do with them. But during this sort of extra period of, of quiet, I suppose, where, you know, the art world closed down and, you know, people were still in touch with each other, but to a much lesser degree. And the, the kind of... Um, sort of epidemic of having to work quickly and fast and thinking about things and shows and traveling. It just, everything kind of slowed down. And I think really because it, that happened, I was able to really concentrate and thinking, start to think about, in a way, drawing in space, which is... But that's exactly what these are. I mean, th these, are the, these, these aren't solid objects like all of the other large sculptures before. Yeah, they, exactly. They, they'd been, you know, I'd, I'd been thinking about trying to make something like this for a while, and I'd, I'd been to a foundry, and they were trying to get me to use VR to do it, and you know, do all these ridiculous things that are just completely against my nature. Um, and I, I just knew that it wasn't the way to do it. That I, I had to just use my hands, be on my own, work very quietly, and just try and figure it out. So each piece of wood was um, uh, sort of covered in resin and made solid. And then it was painted and painted and painted and painted. So it has this, this sort of uh, texture to it, which is uh, almost like chalk. So it feels very, very fragile, but isn't in fact. And it's in about, um, 
sort of seven sections, and then there's the, the odd bit of wood that you have to take off and kind of pin on afterwards. Um, um, it's interesting to me that we were looking earlier at Ghost, which you said was to, w one of the ideas behind it is to mummify the air. And this is called Poltergeist, which is a very similar title to Ghost, but it does not mummify the air at all. It lets air go through it. Well, it's a, it's a noisy ghost, isn't it, a poltergeist? And yeah. it was a way of trying, trying to think about um, trying to make a very similar thing, but make it, make it the sort of skeleton of it, to make it inside out, to make the, yeah, the kind of skin and bones, the sort of flayed skin and the bones. And um, yeah, that, that was really how, you know, I often um, sort of anthropomorphize um, objects and things um, because it somehow makes it easier to relate to them or something. Um, you yeah. made a, another work similar to this at the same time, which is called Doppelgänger. So your two most recent works have roughly German titles. So that might be <laughs> a moment to, <laughs> to end. To, to wind this down and see if anyone has any questions. And no, I can't speak German. <laughs> so any questions in English, please. <laughs> um, thank you, Rachel. Um, I mean, Rachel obviously makes a lot of other work, but these are the sort of, this is a run through of the larger kind of physical space demanding objects and pieces that you've made, including public ones and slightly less public ones. Does anyone have any questions? Ooh, Heike. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Rachel. Um, uh, well, first of all, thanks so much for introducing us to your work by your own words. I think it's uh, very precious for us. And I think the recent development I find very brave because you switch your position from the extremely mo monumental work to very fragile work. And I was just wondering, because of this um, fragility, is it also interesting for you to, um, do, for example, to document your own perception by this by this uh, tr space which you can look through, or is it something you don't you don't stand inside, for example, or to look? Through, yeah. Well, it's not. It's not. If I mean, you, obviously, you, I've stood inside it yes. to, to make it. Um, of course. But I, I made a decision that I didn't want people to be able to go inside it. It felt like that it was something to be observed rather than to participate in. And, you know, and I think that's, you know, that's what I've done with all of my work. It's something that runs through everything. Um, but I do, um, you know, I agree wholeheartedly that it was a brave thing to do. Not that I'm saying, you know, I'm so brave doing it, but more that it was, for me, it was, um, it was like throwing everything up in the air and just going, okay, let's just see what happens. And, you know, I, some of my kind of dearest friends that work in the art world, and, um, and I remember one, uh, Anne uh, coming to the studio, and I said, I've got something to show you, and it's a bit different. So, you know, she went, okay. And she came in, and her face <laughs> was like, you know, she just didn't know what... To how to look, she didn't know what she was reading, and um, it was quite an extraordinary moment, really. And um, she got used to it, <laughs> and then came back a few weeks later, actually. But I think she was really, really, genuinely very, very surprised. And then, you know, another woman, Ivana, came to the studio, and she just was completely silent, and you know, was wandering around looking at all, and then said. This is a masterpiece, but you know it took it really took her forty minutes to look at it to do in order to sort of decide that that's what she wanted to say and you know I, I think as an artist that's been working for you know nearly forty years um, you know seriously working for nearly forty years uh, I'm very proud to have been able to do that actually because uh, I think it's quite a 
difficult thing to do. But, you know, I've always worked in many different mediums. Um, you know, it's something that I think makes my work quite different to a lot of my contemporaries that I, you know, I play with, you know, colour and form and, <clears throat> you know, things are 3D and 2D. And, you know, I think because I originally trained as a painter, uh, I somehow, my you know, I can... I have the confidence to deal with a maybe a slightly larger language or something. Um, yeah, which is, which is, I suppose, a good thing, but... Um, yeah, no, it's, it's been an interesting development. And actually, you know, since making the two works, I've been trying to um, do some other works in, in a similar way, and I'm finding it very hard. I mean, I know it's there, and I've got all the pieces, and I'm sort of ready to go, but I haven't re quite been able to find the form to put it in. Um, so it's challenging, which is good. You know, it's good to be challenged. Um, thank you for a really good talk. Um, I noticed you used the word a number of times, out there or over there. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether this is, or whether you consider the works exports, or whether this is a reference to your um, English perception of the world. Oh, I don't know. Um, I didn't know I even said that, so... <laughs> I asked the question as an Australian. I mean, I'm from out there. Ah, OK. Well, over there, I'd say. Over there, yes. <laughs> down, down there. Um, well, all I can say was I was very pleased that I was able to walk through the European line when I came to the airport yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, sorry, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> There's... Um, Um, yeah, uh, amazing. I already introduced myself to you yesterday. It's wonderful to see your work in 1991 and to see it again today. It's really an honor. Um, I want to build a little bit on what Heiko just mentioned. I think I'll use the word solidity, maybe not monumentality versus fragility. I think in all of the previous works, it's, there's something incredibly solid. Uh, um, it resists the elements. And this one is, seems like it's battered, you know? It's what, like the, the, the primitive hut that's really been in a windstorm. Do you think, um, I don't know, going forward, the notion of weathering, would you ever work with other materials that actually weathered that, that would, could transform, you know, versus like a, a spectrum from solid to fragile? Um, well, you know, I've always quite liked the idea of making something underwater. And I think, um, you know, I think if you do that, then it, then it changes in, in a, you know, a very natural way. You know, I think if you have something out in the elements, it changes. And, some, you know, sometimes with some of the... the there's a piece um, in St. Louis, and, and it's, it's changed to when they purchased the work. And, you know, it has quite an extreme environment there. And I said, well, you know... It's outdoors. It's outdoors, and these, this, is, this is what happens. And, you know, there's some lime um, coming onto the surface, and I love the idea of having almost like sort of stalactites and things coming on the surface of it. Um, yeah, and, you know, it's quite... I suppose, I think, you know, when you make something like that, you need to put something in the beginning of a, a kind of statement just saying, this will change with time and this could change with the weather. But in terms of, of, of you, you know, using materials which um, are definitely going to change, you know, that you, you know, like, if you put bronze outside, it's going to, the patina is going to happen. If you put copper outside. But, you know, of course, there are new materials being developed all the time. Um, but, you know, I tend to stick with a certain kind of, um, uh, kind of lexicon of materials which I, I know I can trust, you know, in a way. And, um, you know, I'm always interested to see the development of other materials, but at the moment I, I kind of use what I use. There's a question over here and there's one here. 
Thank you very much. It was so impressing um, to, to, to see all of this architectural work. And um, in a way, it feels so natural for me that you do this now, because it's, it feels as if you cast your own work again. Um, and um, the house, for example, um, it looks m much more heavy than it ever had been as its original. It's so solid, even if it's not, because it's... Yes, yeah, yeah, this is good, yeah. And, and this now uh, is like, is without gra gravity. It, so suddenly it's not, no, it's, it's, there's no gravity anymore. And this, um, yeah, again, a very strong poetic aspect in it. And um, it seems like just the other side of it again. Well, I, I, think, I think you're right, but it took me an awfully long time to get there. You know, some of these things which seem extremely simple um, are the hardest to do. And I think it's, uh, yeah, it just comes from a, a lot of time and experience. Um, but yeah, no, I, I'm very, you know, I love the way this new work has developed and um, I'm sure it's something that will, you know, take me into all sorts of different areas. But, it, it, you know, it's kind of inter interesting. I was talking about going to a foundry and, and they had this sort of way of making work in three dimensions using um, virtual reality. And, and this, they convinced me to go down there and sort of try it out. And I've never been so perplexed by something in my life of trying to build this thing out of, you know, some kind of electronic program. It just didn't make any sense to me at all, which made me even more determined to go back to the studio and just sort of pick up sticks and start working like that. But, you know, I think the other thing is a lot of these uh, other works that, uh, you know, you've seen uh, have had to be made with other people. And, you know, there was definitely a time um, where I stopped enjoying working. Not that I don't enjoy work, working with other people, but I got fed up with being a, a producer of my own work. And actually what I really love to do is use my hands and to make it myself. And, um, you know, that's the, the privilege of, you know, being able to do that and being able to find the, uh, the time and the, the courage to do it again, actually, you know, to get back to that. Because I think a lot of artists get, you know, they get so used to having work manufactured for them. Um, that it becomes, uh, you know. Well, there's a very interesting aspect in your work uh, regarding scale and uh, tectonics, I would say. So in the first work of the cast pieces, I think I was really intrigued that actually it's the real space, but once the cast is exposed, it looks without scale somehow. Um, it looks much smaller than a house, but it's still the same interior space, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I was wondering now also, it, it was a, it's, it's a space, some um, architectural space without tectonics. But still, somehow, um, I, maybe you can elaborate a little bit of this. I, I had the idea that you probably had also to work together with a structural engineer. Yes. Because <laughs> yeah. you have this, um, you know, still the flooring is the same thing. And how is this solved, you know, to keep the house, you know, yeah, in it was place? A, yeah, it it's was not actually, so easy, yeah. I guess. Well, no, it was actually incredibly simple. You know, uh, um, the engineer, well, you know, was a very creative engineer, but it was an incredibly simple thing where you just literally made a foundation within the building and then you sort of tied everything into that in a series of, of, of kind of U's, I suppose. Um, and boxes and you know that would be cast and tied in with steel and then you'd go up to the next bit and tie that in and then eventually um, you know sort of t literally peel away the outside of the building yeah I mean you know I find you know I always find it interesting working with engineers um, I don't want to offend any any engineers in here but the, the over specificity that you have to do in order to make a building in a public place, you know, is, and 
you know, normally, and I don't want to, you know, I think artists and sculptors especially have a real feel for weight and form and and a kind of um, the way things sit in a way, you know, and how things balance and, you know, and generally, you know, I could look at something and we'll come to the same conclusion that, uh, you know, an engineer will, will come to, and, you know, that comes from experience and experience is working with engineers, but also just understanding what materials do. Um, yeah, but obviously I'm not under the same sort of stringent um, things that, you know, built buildings have to be, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Heike, thank you for inviting Rachel's talk at your symposium, and thank you for hosting Rachel and Heike and everyone else. And thank you, Rachel. Thank you.